Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone uh, from coast to coast to coast. Want to welcome you to day three of Truth and Reconciliation Week. Uh, I'm so honored to be making this introduction of the next two knowledge keepers. Uh, the session will include Sheila Rogers, who is a broadcast journalist at CBC and the host and producer of The Next Chapter, a radio program on writing in Canada. Sheila Rogers is also a member of the Métis Nation of Greater Victoria and an honorary witness for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Joining her today in conversation is Monique Gray-Smith. Monique Gray-Smith is of Lakota, Cree and Scottish descent. Monique is a best-selling author of children and youth books, including My Heart Fills with Happiness, You Hold Me Up, When We Are Kind, Speaking Our Truth, A Journey of Reconciliation, Tilly, A Story of Hope and Resilience, Tilly and the Crazy Eights, and Lucy and Lola. We are pleased to welcome you today to the session, Speaking Our Truth. Enjoy. From all over the country to members of the public who are joining us live on the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation's YouTube channel. The interview you are about to see was recorded live for this session, Speaking Our Truth, a conversation with Monique Gray-Smith. My name is Sheila Rogers. I'm a longtime CBC journalist. I'm, I have the honor of being Chancellor of the University of Victoria. But the greatest honor of my life is being an honorary witness to the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. I'm a proud member of the Métis Nation of Greater Victoria, and I am a grateful visitor to the territory unceded and unsurrendered of the Snonemo First Nation. I am joined by the award-winning Cree Lakota Scottish writer Monique Gray-Smith, the author of My Heart Fills with Happiness, illustrated by Julie Flett, Tilly, A Story of Hope and Resilience, Tilly and the Crazy Eights, Speaking Our Truth, a book we're going to talk about today and the ideas from this book, A Journey of Reconciliation. And Monique is also the proud mother of teenage twins. Monique joins me today from her home uh, on the territory of the McClungan peoples. Monique, I invite you to add anything to my introduction to you and to also acknowledge territory where you are. Mm, beautiful. <clears throat> Thank you, Sheila. Tansi and Doti Mac. Uh, grateful to be with you today. Thank you for joining us. And I come from the shared territories, the Lekwungen speaking people and the Wasanich people. And I look out my window when there's all shades of greens and yellows and oranges and reds. And I see like the apples are changing right in front of me. And I'm grateful to those who have been the caretakers and the stewards for generations and the young citizens like yourselves who are taking care of the land and the water today and very grateful to be a visitor on these territories and to be joining you, Sheila, and to all who are joining us, much gratitude. Thank you, Monique. I, I'm uh, excited to have this session with you. I love speaking with you. I always learn so much. And we're at a very important day. We're, we're one mm. day away from Orange Shirt Day and also the first national day of truth and reconciliation. I want to talk about Orange Shirt Day first. What does, what does this day mean to you? Well, I start by thinking of it as courage and the courage of Phyllis Webstad to begin to talk about her experience back in 2013 in Williams Lake at the celebrate, not the celebration, but at the St. Joseph's Mission School and her story about you know, being seven years old and going to town with her grandma, knowing she was going to be going to residential school and getting an orange shirt because she wanted something beautiful to wear. And that was her favorite color. And how the very next day at residential school, that short shirt was taken away rather harshly and she never saw it again. So orange shirt day for her. And she never imagined it would be like it is today. But her courage in telling her story and reclaiming the importance of wearing orange has had a profound ripple across our whole country. You know, you and I are wearing orange today. Mm -hmm. I see lots of people always wearing orange with Every Child Matters. Every day we wear orange, we remember Phyllis and her story and all of those who went to residential school, those who didn't come home and all of our families who have lived the ripple effects 
of our ancestors and our family members who went to residential school. Can you talk about those ripple effects, Monique? I see in my family, one of them was, you know, my mom was removed at birth because her parents weren't see, seen as able to care for her. And so that has been a disrupt in my family since 1940. That's just one impact. I think the impact um, as our society about generations not being told the truth of the policies and the legislations in this place we call Canada. I have teachers saying to me, I didn't grow up, no, how, how did I not know this? And I'm always like, it was very strategic. It was a concentrated plan that we did not know the truth. And now we do. I think ripples continue to be things like child apprehension, addictions, family violence, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Like there are a lot of ripples that would lead back to residential schools. And this was intentional. This was government policy. I've heard uh, Rai Moran, who's the former uh, director of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation, say that residential schools and all the policies that went along with it uh, were an attack on love mm -hmm. and love for oneself, for family, for community, for your culture, for all the things that were taken away, that were interrupted at best and completely taken away at worst. And one that we don't talk about very often, language, I think, is part of that also, Sheila, the love for language and how, you know, our languages are verb-based, they're alive. English is a noun-based language, so it really makes it easy to dissociate from things, but also our love for the land and the water and just what a disrupt that has been and continues to be. And that um, I think it's one of the pieces we don't talk enough, talk about enough was the impact of residential schools and our connection and our responsibilities to the land and to the water and to all living beings. So yeah. what does it make you feel when you see young people claiming that responsibility and really acting towards it? Mm, I get teary. And not teary out of grief. You know, one time um, Elder Diane Longboat said to me, tears can only be present in the presence of spirit. And so I think about that with love, right? That it's this love and like pride and like grateful that they have the self-determination to stand up like that. And grateful for those who have gone the generations before who have made it possible for us to stand up like that today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You and I have spoken um, before about the voice of the little ones whose bodies now have been uh, verified mm -hmm. at residential schools across the country and how their voice is such a, a guide for people and people are really hearing the little ones in a way that they didn't necessarily hear the Truth and Reconciliation final report. What do you think that's about? I think about, you know, at the closing ceremonies when Dr. Marie Wilson was speaking, one of the commissioners, and she talked about the children who never came home. And she talked about the unmarked graves and she talked about the parental devastation. And she said, can you imagine? And I think what happened at the end of May when Tecamloops to Sequetmec first that first became knowledge and now, you know, continued communities. But I think what happened there was individuals began to imagine what that might have been like. And in the empathy, the change can happen, right? Because it's like, oh my gosh, what if that was my child or my grandchild or my niece or my nephew? And then in that empathy, we begin to understand why there are some societal challenges why the stereotypes are still so prevalent. And so those children who, whose lives now we are finally beginning to honor and hold up with dignity. And that's a big part of what, you know, September 30th is about. It's not a holiday. Just, I just wanna cringe when people say, oh, it's a holiday. It's not a holiday, it is a day of honoring and remembering and figuring out What's my role in moving forward so I can honor those little ones that never came home? 
What's my family's role in moving forward? What's my community? How do I contribute to my community as we move forward so that we have a more civil society? I mean, if those little ones and the losses of their lives don't inspire us to have a more civil society, I'm not sure what will, Sheila. A couple of things out of what you've said, Monique. I, I remember Dr. Wilson as well, and she always carried a rattle with her mm -hmm. to remind her of the children, to always remember the children. Uh, for the child taken, for the parent left behind, which was the motto of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Mm -hmm. And the day that, uh, it was the day that the summary was released, there was a ceremony at Rideau Hall where our, our new Governor General, Mary Simon, the first Indigenous Governor General is, she was an honorary witness as well. And we came across this heart that was planted on a stake into the grounds of Rideau Hall and it said they buried us but they didn't know we were seeds which I, I actually just get goosebumps thinking about and the seeds are growing mm -hmm. and it you know I immediately you know I think you know where I'm going to go right now because I think about this wonderful young man in speaking our truth named Sahaj who talks about seeds and trees as this wonderful analogy. Can you tell us about Sahaj and what he told mm, you? Mm -hmm. I had first met Sahaj, he was a student at Selkirk Montessori here in Victoria, beautiful, profound school. And his class was reading Tilly in grade five. And I went in for a visit and he was just one of those students. And some of you watching, you're this student, you've got lots of questions, mm. but you're also so respectful. You don't take up the whole space. Right? You wait and you make sure that everybody has an opportunity. But there was like stars coming out of his eyes. So when I was writing Speaking Our Truth, I knew that I wanted to include young people's voices. So I reached out and the, the school connected me with his family. And I went over to visit and we had a little feast. And then his mom, after about an hour, said, okay, you can visit with my boy. So we went to the couch. And the last question I always asked, whether it was survivors or elders or intergenerational or the young, young students was, what does reconciliation mean to you? And he had just turned 11 the week before. And he slid his bum to the edge of the couch and he kind of <laughs> rubbed his chin. And I thought, I'm like sitting with a little old man. And I'm gonna read, I, I think I've got it marked here, what he said to me, because for me, it was transformative really around um the potential we have in our contributions and in our lives so let me just find one person can make a difference so every one of you watching us today you have that potential to make a difference you don't have to have a big crowd with you you can be one person and create a crowd by standing up for what is right it's like the ripple effect if someone says something then another person can branch off from that the first idea is like a seed for a tree. The next idea grows the trunk and then the branches and then the leaves and then the fruit. In Canada and in reconciliation, we're at the branch. The fruit hasn't come yet. When the fruit comes, our country will be a much nicer place to live in. And so we've still got a big chunk of work to get to the place where the fruit is present for everyone that it's equitable and equal in our society in Canada. So, so beautifully said. You talked to a number of young people for this book. How much did they know about residential school and, and the residential school era? Yeah, so these interviews would have happened late 2016 and very few knew anything. Um, they weren't yet really learning much in school. And I really, you know, hope that for most students that has changed, most were learning it from their families at dinner conversations or from listening to CBC, right? That those were the, some of the places where the discussions were beginning to unfold. I really do believe if I was to interview today that it would be different, mm -hmm. that through the courage of teachers and um, administrators and families pushing for their children to understand the truth of Canada, that students would have a better understanding. Not in all places, that's not the truth everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. But um, 
I do feel like it has changed somewhat. Monique, why is it important for young people to understand the truth of this time, of the residential school time? I think because you as the young people or you adults who are joining us who are supporting young people, you're our future. And I don't say that just kind of off the cuff, but you are going to be the bank managers, the CEOs, the Department of Fisheries, you're going to own your own business, you're going to be law, um, people who take care of lawns and gardens, you're going to be school administrators, you're going to be dentists, you're going to be flight attendants, you're going to be taking care of us and you're gonna be taking care of the next generation. And so how you do that is really important for us as a society and knowing the history allows you to have empathy and to take perspective and lead your life in a different way than if you didn't know the truth. And so I think it's absolutely fundamental in how we move forward. I think uh, you, what you've said applies to, to everybody, but when you apply it to young people, I feel so much hope. And from reading the, the kids that are, are in your book and also just talking with young people, they are kind, they are smart, they have hope, and they seem to have this built-in sense of fairness. Mm -hmm. This is good, this is bad, and I just, want to give the reins over to them sometimes and right see what would happen how wonderful would that be i just that's a rhetorical question but i really think about that because they also aren't you as young people you don't yet have years of this is how it's been done you have this imagination you have this ability to think in a transformative way and when you do that in collaboration with a kind heart and an empathic heart everybody will be better for it. And I often think about that quote, I don't remember the exact one, but you know, if there's you know, all these boats in a bay, when the tide comes in, they all go up. And so when I thrive, when you thrive, Sheila, when the students who are joining us, the families who are joining us thrive, we all thrive. And that's really important. A rising tide floats mm -hmm. all boats. See, I knew you would know. <laughs> <laughs> I actually think you gave me that quote, seriously. <laughs> you have spoken with um, so many survivors and intergenerational survivors because it's very important to remember that the impacts, as you say, the ripple effects happen to the children of residential school students and their children's children. What do you think they want young people to know about them? Oh, <clears throat> I would say the truth yeah. about what happened in school, the impact on them, the people they love, their families, their connection, as you said, to culture and language and to the land, mm -hmm. but also that they're here. Mm -hmm. And some are thriving, some are flying, some are resilient. Everybody has their lived experience, but that the truth and that, just as you said that beautiful quote, that they are seeds, that even with all that happened, we are still here. You know, it was part of the policies that we wouldn't be here. And we're still here and we're, you know, I think three times the fastest growing population in this country. So it says a lot about our resilience, but I believe that we we have a lot of respect to the survivors for, you know, in many ways, I think when you're walking through the forest, the first person going through, you know, pushes the branches aside so everybody else can come through with ease. And I think that's what the survivors have done for us. And for many, it has cost their lives, mm -hmm. but they have brought the branches aside so we can come through. And I think Is that your dog? It's the neighbor's dog. <laughs> so, I have a yes. dog here too. He's being very quiet. But yes, that's that's great, great affirmation. <laughs> Monique, I want to ask you to turn to another one of your books, which I think is, it's really lovely. It's also timely. And obviously people can see it's called When We Are Kind. What was the beginning of this book for you? Mm, I was actually in... Um, 
Arizona with my family. My son was there playing ball and he was on a team where they just brought all these kids from Canada together to play. And all these acts of kindness kept happening between them. And as they did, the team got better and better and better as the tournament went on. And I also saw all these acts of kindness between my twins who at the time were 14, which doesn't always happen, <laughs> but it was. And so I woke up one morning thinking about kindness at very early 4.30 in the morning. And that's how the book came. And it's illustrated by the incredible Nicole Neardhart. Um, she just brings the book to life so profoundly. So that's how it came. And, you know, I also do a lot of study about our brain neurobiology. And I know that when I am kind or when somebody is kind to me, that's why it's so important we receive kindness. But also if I witness an act of kindness in my brain, that cortisol, which is the stress hormone, it goes down. And oxytocin, which is known as like the love hormone or the hug hormone, it goes up. Mm -hmm. which means that our ability to be present to be you know a civil citizen changes and I think that's why kindness is so important and yes with each other but also with all living beings with the animals those that fly with the land and with the water is really important I think the dog heard you because <laughs> now the dog is being quiet <laughs> Apologies for that, folks. <laughs> oh, not at all. It's always a great moment on Zoom. And I'm, I'm going to miss it when we go back into in-person gatherings. We'll have to bring our own dogs. <laughs> Will you read When We Are Kind for us? Sure. Great. I just gave away my last edition with it. Oh. In, um, the edition you were showing, Sheila, yes. is in um, English and Diné, or the Navajo language that is Nicole's ancestry. Mm -hmm. And so I've got... Um, only the English one, I just gave away my last one. So um, always, I think it's important that we show, you know, like when we are kind, written, I put the words in Monique Grace Smith and illustrated by Nicole Neodhart. And it's always important to talk about the illustrator because sitting with us today are many future illustrators. And if we don't acknowledge and hold up who brings the words to life, then we miss part of the importance of being kind in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to show you the illustrations and I'll read off to the side of it. I am kind when I help my family. I am kind when I share with my friends. I am kind when I take my dog for an extra long walk. I am kind when I help my neighbor. I am kind when I bring food to my elders. I am kind when I only take from the earth what I need. I am kind when I take care of myself and get a good night's sleep. I feel joy when my family and I are kind. I feel happy when my friend is kind to me. I feel comforted when my cat is kind to me. I feel loved when my elders are kind to me. I feel grateful when the earth is kind to me. I feel respectful when I am kind to myself. And when we are kind, we remember we are all related. And it, mm -hmm. I love how Nicole did this illustration reminding us that, you know, yes, we are related to each other as human beings, but we're also related to the four-legged, those that fly, those that swim, those that crawl, those that slither. <laughs> the animals, the flowers, the sky, related to all of it.
It's beautiful. All of that. And such a, a beautiful collaboration between the two of you. It's really lovely. I want to ask you about one of the panels here. And it's mm -hmm. this one. I feel respectful when I'm kind to myself. Mm -hmm. That's really important, isn't it? Especially mm -hmm. for young people. And in these times that we're living in with the pandemic and the truth being revealed, you know, there is a lot of stress. There is a lot of things happening for everyone. You as young people, us as adults. And so being kind to ourselves is really important because I don't know about you, but if I'm not being kind to myself, then I can get a little bit grumpy and a little bit irritable and a little bit deflated. And my hope can be down in the pinky, my pinky toe. And kindness is like a salve, right? You know, when you fall and um, skin your knee, somebody might put something on it. I think kindness is a salve that we need as a society right now. And it starts with us. If I'm not being kind to me, it can be hard to be kind to somebody else. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a lovely place to to conclude our conversation. I, I would like, though, to offer you the opportunity to just say a, a last word or two, Monique. Mm, well, I offer much gratitude to the survivors who have had the courage, like Phyllis Webstead, to share their stories with us so that I and all of us can be a better human, that we can attempt to have a healthier society. I'm grateful to all of the honorary witnesses who keep standing up and reminding us about the truth. And to all of you young people and who those who have joined us today, thank you for being on the journey of reconciliation and reconciliation. Mm. Yeah, much gratitude. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Echo say and mm. um, hi, hi. Hi, <laughs> hi. Lovely to speak with you again. Yeah. And I, I want to thank, as Monique did, everybody who's watching, the students and the teachers and members of the public who have tuned in as well. And on behalf of Monique and I, I wish you all a meaningful and memorable Orange mm. Shirt Day and National Day for Truth and Reconciliation tomorrow. Mm -hmm. All the best. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a special thank you to Monique and Sheila for that beautiful session and uh, some great messages and knowledge learned uh, during those uh, 30 minutes. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, there's lots more throughout the week and, uh, and keep enjoying the sessions with our gifted, uh, wonderful knowledge keepers. Thank you. <laughs>